like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rachel Hart. Dr. Hart is a board certified geriatrician with specialized training in memory care with Norton Neuroscience Institute Memory Center. She graduated from medical school at the Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. She completed her internal medicine residency at Christ Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, and completed her geriatric medicine fellowship at the University of Cincinnati Christ Hospital program. As a geriatrician, she has training in caring for older adults with multiple in multiple settings, but now specializes in memory disorders. Welcome, Rachel, and I appreciate you doing the presentation today. Thank you. All right, thank you for joining today. Um, today's review is gonna be on the diagnosis and management of non-Alzheimer's dementias. Just kind of goals for the presentation. Uh, first of all, just to review the evaluation process for cognitive impairment, and then identify non-Alzheimer's dementias, and last, understand the management of the types of non-Alzheimer's dementias. Um, so first of all, just a short review of evaluating cognitive impairment. Um, it really requires more than um, a subjective history of memory loss. Um, a lot of the things that we'll talk about as far as um, evaluating for different types of dementia, we really need to have some kind of objective cognitive impairment. So that means um, doing a memory test, some kind of cognitive screening test, but also having a history of significant cognitive dysfunction. So that could include anything from aphasia, where there's obvious impairment in language, either um, understanding written word or spoken word or being able to produce that spoken word. Apraxia, which means our brain has or our uh, Muscles have the ability to do routine tasks like brushing our teeth or using a microwave, but our brain can't give us the information to do that. And then agnosia is somewhere, something where people can no longer recognize familiar objects or familiar faces. So that's going to be um, maybe, for instance, not recognizing a grandchild and how that relationship exists with them. Or the significant cognitive dysfunction will be a decrease in their executive function, their ability to plan and organize tasks. So that's when someone has difficulty um, being able to return to driving a car, um, maybe organizing medications or organizing their appointments. And then there has to be some kind of history of decline in function, their day-to-day -day activities, and we have to be able to exclude any reversible causes of cognitive impairment. So that's why we'll do some routine um, office testing with things like making sure there's no thyroid dysfunction, no electrolyte issues or acute renal failure. Um, and then the standard uh, cognitive screening test is gonna be a MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. This is a 30 point questionnaire with the greatest um, ability to look at other domains besides memory. And there are standard cutoffs. Um, so if someone scores under a 26, um, that's abnormal. So whether that's a mild, moderate, or severe, there are cutoffs specifically for that. Um, you may also do something very short. Um, a MOCA takes about 12 to 15 minutes for most patients to complete. Um, another screening test in the office you might use is something called a mini mental status exam. An MMSC can take about eight to 10 minutes, um, also scored out of 30 points or even something as short as a mini cog, which is a three item recall and a clock draw test. Now, both of these, um, if there's an impairment, they're probably gonna need to do further memory testing, but at least it's a starting point to know who needs the evaluation. So thinking about non-Alzheimer's dementias, uh, when I was in training as a resident and even as a fellow, we kind of had this idea that dementias were really going to be um, one type or the other. So we thought that the majority of our dementias would fall under an Alzheimer's picture, 65% at least. Vascular dementia would be 15%. And then our other types like frontal lobe dementia or Lewy bodies would be a very small number. But actually uh, what we found is that um, there are still a large number of Alzheimer's diseases but more and more we're identifying that this mixed dementia um, is taking up a higher percentage. So we think at least 20% of dementias are going to be mixed pathology, meaning maybe it's going to be a Lewy body and Alzheimer's disease. Maybe it'll be a vascular dementia and a Lewy body disease. Um, but so that may be why it's more challenging to treat some of these dementias because we're dealing with more than one pathology. 
But from a clinical side, we still try to identify someone as having um, a dementia and identifying the primary type that they have. So these are the four types that are still the most common, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body, and vascular dementia. So we'll go through a case of um, the three less common um, in Alzheimer's. So our first patient is a 58-year-old minister. He presented with a one-year history of progressive personality and behavior changes. He had begun acting sillier and more childish, exhibiting socially inappropriate behavior. He was also more apathetic and quieter, but would laugh much more at odd situations. He became focused on particular forms of music, and he had begun gambling, which resulted in a large loss of money. He ate the same meal for breakfast, a particular cereal plus one banana, and a lunch, um, always two peanut butter and raspberry jam sandwiches, each day, and he would get upset if his meal plan was altered in any way. He did not exhibit his usual sense of empathy or sympathy toward family or members of his congregation. His usual sleep schedule changed from sleeping seven hours per night to needing only four. He had no obvious change in his cognition that was appreciated by family members, but they had members of his church were greatly concerned about the changes in his behavior. He, however, did not understand the concerns that others expressed and repeatedly stated that he felt fine and that nothing was wrong. Otherwise, he was in good general health. Um, he did have a family history of uh, dementia in his mother um, in her 70s. So initially, this patient was evaluated by a primary care provider and then a psychiatrist, leading to a diagnosis of an atypical bipolar disorder. Um, his behavioral features seemed to respond to valproic acid, um, but he remained gregarious um, and often with inappropriate comments toward others. And this continued to escalate over the next six months. At that time, he, um, family had started noticing that he developed increasing forgetfulness, and there were also elements of executive dysfunction. Um, specifically, he was having issues remembering things like um, when doctor's appointments were. Um, he was having a hard time identifying um, the schedule for his church services um, and how to organize things for his sermons. He missed appointments and social engagements sometimes forgot details of recent events and was unable to deliver sermons without referring to notes. He was unable to manage the financial and organizational complexities of the ministry, and then his primary care referred him for neuropsychology and neurologic evaluation. So this gentleman um, initially had an MMSC of 23. Um, his neuropsychology testing was notable for mild impairment in delayed recall and language skills and executive dysfunction. Physically, had a normal neurologic exam, um, but he was very gregarious, very joking, um, and said some socially inappropriate comments, um, was very hugging um, or physically hugging towards a lot of members in the office. His MRI brain showed um, some atrophy, especially in the right amygdala and the mesofrontal regions. At this point, he was diagnosed with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia and ended up being prescribed escitalopram for his behaviors. Um, so clinically, he meets a lot of what we would expect with a frontotemporal dementia, um, but he was followed for about eight years until his death. Um, behavior management remained the greatest challenge, especially in the later stages. He became very compulsive, wanting a lot of sweets. They had to be locked away. And at 71, he developed secondary Parkinsonism um, and had very minimal improvement with his carbidopa. Um, so from a diagnosis standpoint, frontotemporal dementia, um, probably the two most important tests, um, neuropsychology testing, very helpful in this case, um, and also our um, MRI scans. So if the gentleman, um, the first picture on the, uh, for A and B um, was when he was diagnosed, and then C and D was about six years later. So you can see that initially on um, is a diagnosis in uh, panel A, a lot of the um, atrophy that we see is going to be in his frontal lobes, whereas six years later, we're also seeing atrophy through other parts of the brain, and that's pretty specific. Same way over here, um, you know, we see some atrophy level here at the beginning, uh, mainly in his frontal lobes, but um, later stages, that's going to become pretty diffuse. Um, 
So if we think about frontotemporal dementia, um, this type of dementia is going to be caused by an abnormal amount of a tau protein and a protein called TDP43. These proteins both accumulate inside neurons in both the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. And that's why we tend to have two different types of frontotemporal dementias. But most commonly with behavioral variants, frontotemporal dementia, the first symptoms, even before cognitive symptoms, will be behavioral. Difficulty planning and organizing, impulsive, and we either have emotional flatness, a lack of empathy, or we uh, become having excessive emotions. And for some people, they can switch back and forth between those two. Especially later in the disease, like our patient, um, motor symptoms are common. Tremors like shaky hands, balance, um, frequent falls can become a problem. And because of the executive dysfunction, um, that's why we'll start seeing difficulty with planning and organizing, just like our gentleman had a hard time organizing things for his ministry. Um, we also will see because this TDP43 deposits in the temporal lobes, that it becomes difficult to make and understand speech. Um, so two different subtypes. Um, this gentleman had a behavioral variant FTD, which was caused by the frontal lobe degeneration. The majority of his TDP43 would have been in the frontal lobe. This type of patient is generally younger onset, usually in their 50s. And again, first symptoms, um, not surprisingly, often lead to a psychiatry appointment, um, looking at emotional ability, impulsivity, and a lot of these patients are diagnosed in, incorrectly with a bipolar disorder. Um, and then our other type of frontotemporal dementia is a primary progressive aphasia, usually more in our 70s before we'll see this, but temporal lobe degeneration because of that TDP43 um, causes progressive language disturbance first rather than the behavioral issues. Unfortunately for frontotemporal dementias, um, at this point we don't have medications that are thought to be disease modifying. Um, we will sometimes use um, a cholinesterase inhibitor like denepazil to see if it provides a benefit of slowing progression, but it doesn't, doesn't often appear that it does. Um, the main treatment for this is really symptom control. Most of these patients will require antidepressants or mood stabilizers. So our second case, 68-year-old um, gentleman, um, he had gradual onset of forgetfulness for approximately one year. Family members also noted that he sometimes appeared to briefly blank out during conversations. On his initial assessment, his MMSE was a 27. Um, he did have some impaired orientation and recall. On his neuropsychology testing, there was impaired memory and executive function both. Um, neurologic exam for him, um, the only thing of note was that he had a slightly stooped posture or some thoracic kyphosis. Um, this patient received a diagnosis of mild Alzheimer's dementia and was started on denepazil. 18 months later, um, he started having episodes of seeing people who were not there. These began while he was being treated for a UTI but persisted for months after. He reported seeing children and sometimes animals in the room for minutes at a time and was not sure whether they were real or not. His wife reported that he was now sleeping poorly with vivid dreams. Um, he would thrash, kick in bed, sometimes yell incoherently. He would also often doze during the day. Um, now when he did an MMSC, it was a 22, and he had marked difficulty drawing the numbers on a clock and drawing the hands to show the time. Motor exam revealed um, that his voice was much softer or hypophonic. Um, he had a decreased blink reflex and um, he did not have a tremor. Um, he did continue to have um, a stooped posture and he needed to use his arms to arise from the chair. There was a slight slowing and shuffling of the gait. And then about 12 months later, um, still reported having visual hallucinations, children walking in the garden, um, he had decreased interest in activities, slept often during the day, and now at a year later, his MMSC had dropped to 15. Um, and again, some of these um, motor symptoms, a softer voice, slowed gait, um, and difficulty turning continue to progress. So this gentleman, um, the notable history of visual hallucinations, um, the symptoms that were suggestive of an REM sleep disorder, um, and the Parkinsonism on exam, 
but also the more rapid decline than expected on an MMSE are all suggestive of a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. Um, again, also when I was in training um, in residency and fellowship, we thought of Lewy body disease and Parkinson's really as two different diagnoses, but how we're understanding them more now, um, that view is shifting to that they're both something called alpha-synucleinopathies, so caused by a protein alpha-synuclein, and either they have a predominant motor symptoms, which is Parkinson's disease, or they have predominant cognitive symptoms, which ends up being Lewy body. Um, we also now have another diagnostic tool, um, a biomarker that involves a skin biopsy called SYN1, and it's actually um, has the ability to test this alpha synuclein in the skin. Um, so when patients undergo a skin biopsy, um, the alpha synuclein appears red um, in the filaments of the skin. And they have essentially three punch biopsies in places back of their neck, um, kind of cervical, back cervical spine, um, above their shoulder blade, and then um, on their calf. And this is highly sensitive. So if it's Sensitivity is about 97%. Um, so it is something that can confirm Lewy body disease or Parkinson's. So Lewy body dementia, again, um, this alpha synuclein protein um, is a culprit. It um, is an extra protein that builds up inside the neurons and it affects um, the brain's ability to use and manage dopamine. Um, Lewy body disease will present with visual hallucinations, um, Cognitive decline, not always short-term memory, um, but often inability to concentrate, attention is difficult, and disorganization are um, probably the earliest symptoms. Movement symptoms um, can be present, and they are often, but for a Lewy body diagnosis, they do not have to have them. Um, but muscle rigidity, uh, loss of coordination, and reduced facial expressions um, are most common. Sleep disorders, uh, the REM sleep disorder with um, things like thrashing, kicking, yelling out in sleep are common, but also uh, excessive daytime sleepiness or even just plain insomnia that keeps them awake at night. Um, and then I think probably the thing that you know, we're always taught, visual hallucinations usually precede the loss of memory. Um, and clinically, that is also true. Um, again, it's a Parkinson's type syndrome, so often movement symptoms will be treated with carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamon. Um, and then for these patients, um, there is good evidence that our cholinesterase inhibitors um, both help decrease hallucinations and they potentially slow down the progression of the memory or cognitive loss. The drug trials were done with rivastigmine, um, but it's assumed to be a class effect, so any of our cholinesterase inhibitors could be used. And then because these patients do have the movement symptoms, um, our treatment for their hallucinations is limited. Our antipsychotics can cause the Parkinsonism to be worse. So typically we're gonna treat them with quetiapine or pimivin sarin for that. And then our third case as uh, a 76 year old man. He has a past medical history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia presented with a two year history of short-term memory loss. His family had noted changes in his personality, uh, mainly with decreased initiation. So he had a hard time being motivated to start a task. He was no longer engaged and he uh, was interested, he was no longer engaged or interested uh, in family affairs, including spending time with the grandchildren. Uh, he appeared to be generally apathetic. Um, he could still bathe and dress himself, um, but required reminders or encouragement from his family to do so. Um, and generally his response and movements, um, they thought appeared to be slowed. So when he came in for memory testing, uh, his initial MOCA was a 19 out of 30. Um, he had notable deficits in both delayed memory and attention. And his neurologic exam showed slightly increased tone in um, both upper extremities and a slightly decreased right arm swing when walking. His MRI showed multiple lacunar infarcts involving the frontosubcortical circuits, um, but spared the hippocampus. And that's kind of important to think about from um, somebody who has vascular disease, often people who have infarcts that affect the areas that um, around the hippocampus involve a short-term memory. Short-term memory um, becomes a problem for these patients, and that may be an initial symptom. 
Um, so again, um, from a vascular side, um, an MRI scan is going to be very important as far as making a diagnosis. Um, this gentleman had MRI scans um, over or two different sets of MRIs um, over a course of three years. Um, so you can see in 2018, he did have some white matter disease and some lacunar infarcts, but unfortunately this gentleman had a lot of other vascular diseases. Um, so when we throw in diabetes and hypertension, um, oftentimes we're gonna see a progression of that white matter, white matter change, which we see in him. So vascular dementia um, caused by vascular diseases, um, is caused because there's a change or a disruption in blood flow in the brain caused either by blood clots, um, blood plaques, um, or narrowed arteries. So cognitive symptoms vary kind of based on where that vascular change has occurred. So short-term memory loss, like forgetting current or past events can occur, uh, misplacing items, very common. And then also a lot of patients will have a decline in language. So trouble following directions or learning new tasks. Um, and then poor judgment um, and depending on where vascular disease is in the brain, especially if it affects the frontal lobe, we can have a lot of patients will have hallucinations or delusions. So vascular dementia is still considered the second most common type of dementia where it often occurs in mix with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so when we say, uh, or when we have a diagnosis of mixed dementia, most often that's going to be mixed Alzheimer's and vascular. So risk factors, again, are vascular diseases, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, um, a past stroke, and metabolic syndrome are the most important. Um, most common cognitive symptoms are generally going to be executive dysfunction. So patients having difficulty planning, um, or disrupted or organization disruption. And for vascular dementia, um, the brain MRI is probably the most important step or the most important um, diagnostic test for any of our dementias. The MRI is going to be the most helpful. Um, treatment for these, uh, number one is going to be treatment of vascular disease, controlling blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol, um, smoking cessation if these patients are smoking. Um, for stroke prevention, they're often put on antiplatelets, especially aspirin. And then our memory-enhancing medication, the cholinesterase inhibitor, may have modest benefit for these patients. So often they're given a trial of a denepazil. And then our fourth patient, um, 75 or 74-year-old man, um, presented with diabetic peripheral neuropathy and gait difficulty. His exam showed a decrease in his biceps and brachioradialis reflexes, but brisk tricep reflexes. He also had a stocking distribution peripheral neuropathy and complained of some urinary frequency. His gait was impaired. Um, he had slow, small step size, and he had difficulty turning. He did undergo neuropsychological testing, which showed impaired memory. He had a head CT, which showed hydrocephalus with little atrophy. And he also had a cervical MRI, which showed cervical stenosis. Um, it was uh, determined that his cervical stenosis would be treated. So his physician, um, the neurosurgeon, decompressed his cervical spinal cord. Um, his gait did improve significantly, um, and that was documented on serial videotaping of the gait. But about a year later, um, his gait declined again. Um, he had a repeat CT of his head and his hydrocephalus remained, um, but his cervical MRI showed no significant spinal cord compression. So now it was determined that the hydrocephalus needed to be treated. So he underwent a lumbar puncture, removed 30 uh, cc's of fluid, did not particularly improve his gait, um, but he did uh, go on to um, have a shunt surgery um, and his gait did improve from there. Again, this was documented on videotaping. Um, so this is um, not this gentleman's uh, MRR CAT scan, but it is a good example of what we're looking for when we see normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, I will say this is probably one of the most challenging diagnoses in a memory clinic, mainly because a lot of patients who have symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus have other medical conditions that can cause the same types of symptoms that we have. Um, so thinking about normal pressure hydrocephalus, you know, we learn about the triad of cognitive impairment, 
gait abnormality, and then urinary frequency or urgency. However, all of these symptoms can be common with other problems. Just like this gentleman, um, he had cervical stenosis, uh, very common in older adults um, that can cause gait, impair gait abnormalities. He's also the right age that he may have urinary frequency from something like benign uh, prosthetic hypertrophy or hyperplasia. Um, so again, symptoms are common in older adults. And then for normal pressure hydrocephalus, even though you know, the textbook says we have that triad of symptoms, there are patients that have NPH and they may have one or two of those symptoms only. So it probably has the largest differential diagnosis of any of our memory impairment or cognitive impairment disorders. The actual prevalence of NPH is estimated to be very small, probably only about 0.5 to 1% of cases of dementia. So in addition to having some difficulty making a diagnosis, it's also difficult um, in determining or measuring the response. Um, improvement scales for NPH are often subjective. Um, some studies report only about 26% of patients actually have improvement that's sustained at three years. Um, and then the other thing from a memory side is that the shunt surgery typically doesn't improve the cognition. The shunt surgery, um, the primary thing that it is treating is the gait abnormality. And that's really how it's measured as far as being su um, successful is if their gait improves. But the cognition um, or cognitive decline that's a problem because of normal pressure hydrocephalus does not tend to get better after the shunt's placed. So again, um, differential diagnosis of MPH is very large. Um, ventriculomegaly or enlarged ventricles um, can be common with other types of dementia. Gait abnormalities, again, cervical spondylosis, peripheral neuropathy, vestibular dysfunction, even certain medications like antipsychotic use can impact gait. Um, vascular dementia is also a possibility. A lot of older adults with vascular dementia um, ends up being uh, periventricular, or meaning that the largest amount of that white matter disease um, ends up being around the ventricles. That leads to more atrophy and the ventricles um, appearing larger for ventriculomegaly. Parkinson's disease and other related disorders, Lewy body dementia, corticobasal syndrome, multiple system atrophy, um, even primary progressive aphasia, they can often have a lot of the same um, types of change with gait um, that someone with normal pressure hydrocephalus could have on exam. And then there are patients, um, the frontotemporal patients, um, if they have um, uh, atrophy that also includes a part of the brain, the caudate, um, they also can have um, a lot of changes um, with their gait as well that look like an NPH. So if we think about hydrocephalus, um, kind of what's I think important and why this is, is a challenge is that a lot of our patients um, are gonna be in this third category. Um, and if we think about people coming in with memory loss, our dementias like Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, much more common than normal pressure hydrocephalus. So if we take somebody who has Alzheimer's disease, our expected MRI finding is going to be a lot of atrophy. So down here in this third picture, where our brain is smaller in size, um, it's got undergone chronic volume loss, and then the ventricles appear large from a compensation technique called exvacuodilatation. Um, so the sulci in the brain are also enlarged um, proportionally because the parenchyma or brain tissue takes up less room inside the skull. So in this case, the ventricles look larger because the total brain size is much smaller. Versus somebody who has normal pressure hydrocephalus, um, one thing to think about is that we should not see that compensatory ex vacuo dilatation. Um, we also should not see a brain that has the same level of atrophy. We should really be seeing that the ventricles appear larger because of the edema inside the ventricles. And then the um, top picture is a brain um, that's considered a normal brain um, with the ventricles holding proportionally the expected amount of CSF or cerebral spinal fluid. And then our last case um, is a 77-year-old woman who has a history of mild cognitive impairment, 
She presented with increasing confusion and hallucinations for about three months. She did not recognize her children and thought her home was some type of hotel. She thought there was more than one man posing as her husband, and she was often using a broom or a couch cushion to beat at the wall or furniture, telling her children, quote, the varmints had to go. Um, so this woman is a case of what we would consider a rapidly progressive dementia, uh, meaning that her cognitive symptoms and behavioral symptoms occurred very quickly within less than a year. So in this case, um, she had symptoms predominantly over a three-month period. So when we think about rapidly progressive dementias, the ones that we always think about tend to be like creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is our most common prion disease. That's actually not the most common type of rapidly progressive dementia. Primarily what we see are that these patients have a vascular event, either a large stroke or a vasculitis event. They have a metabolic cause. Um, we've had patients who've had sodium levels that have dropped to 106, 108, that will present with rapidly progressive cognitive symptoms that look like a dementia. And then CNS neoplasms, also much more common than prion disease. These patients who have rapid progression of symptoms, these are really the only ones that are an urgency as far as a rapid workup. They tend to have um, the need for extensive workup, including MRIs and CSF studies. Um, and oftentimes these patients require an inpatient setting to get that evaluation done quickly. So this woman, um, you know, this uh, woman that we had seen um, with a three month history of progressive cognitive decline, um, also with visual hallucinations. When she came through the MRI or through the ER, she ended up having an MRI scan that showed that she had a frontal lobe tumor. Um, so that's why she had a lot of hallucinations as a primary symptom. This woman um, thankfully was able to undergo a neurosurgical resection. The tumor was removed. Um, she ended up um, following her hospital stay having um, stay at a skilled nursing facility doing rehab and eventually being able to return home. The hallucinations resolved. Um, her cognition did not get um, back to her pre-diagnosis baseline. Um, she wasn't able to return to that mild cognitive impairment range, unfortunately. Um, but one thing to kind of think about is that in a rapidly progressive dementia is that your differential really needs to be broad. Prion diseases are a potential, um, but they're again, not the most common. Probably the most important, these patients always need to have an MRI scan and pretty extensive lab workup. Even things, um, you know, just making sure that they have, again, a CMP, acute renal failure and um, hyponatremia, again, much more common than prion diseases, can also both present with rapid decline in cognition. Um, and then most of these patients will actually undergo a um, lumbar puncture, checking for CNS infections um, and neoplasia too. But differential is broad. That can be anything from an inflammatory CNS disease, um, a septic encephalopathy, immune-mediated encephalitis, um, neurovascular disease, again, a vasculitis or a stroke uh, most commonly, toxic conditions, um, Wernicke-Korsakoff um, or acute intoxication. Um, or uh, like a, a heavy metal can also cause this. And then other diseases that may mimic, again, CNS neoplasia, like our patient, um, delirium, dehydration, um, certainly psychotic disorders can fall under that, cerebral hypoxia and substance abuse. And then I think that is all. Those were my five cases. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm happy to take those. So um, there are some questions and I will read the first one and then we'll just keep going through. Sure. So first is how often is the skin biopsy pursued and would this be done with dermatology? Um, well, the, uh, I guess it, I would say no, dermatology does not do it. Um, anybody who's trained with a SIN1 biopsy can do it. At Norton, um, it's gonna be in our movement clinic. So our doctors who primarily see Parkinson's patients um, but it's probably going to be within a movement or a memory center who does it. Um, it is a skin biopsy, like a, a punch biopsy. So it's usually scheduled for a 30-minute follow-up patient exam. Um, it's done that day, and the results take about two weeks to come back. 
Um, it's done, I would say, um, I'd, I'd say it's done a fair amount now versus about a year ago when the test became available. This isn't somebody that every patient who has Parkinson's disease would need. So if you see a patient who has, you know, our symptoms of bradykinesia, um, they have a typical um, Parkinsonian gait or a particular tremor, um, clinically they look like they have Parkinson's disease, we're gonna treat them, they wouldn't have a skin biopsy. But where it's been helpful for a Lewy body patient is that there've been um, kind of updated guidelines or criteria based on, you know, if you have these 10 risk factors that include your visual hallucinations, your cognitive impairment, um, your tremor, um, the REM sleep disorder, if you have a set number of that criteria, you'd have a probable Lewy body disease. But if you had two of those criteria, you have a possible Lewy body disease. So those are the patients that this is really primarily for. So let's say you have a patient, he's 75, and the only thing that he has as far as symptoms are visual hallucinations, and he has some mild cognitive impairment. His mocha may be a, you know, 23, 22, primarily his memory is intact, but he may have difficulty with executive function or attention. That patient, you have a suspicion for Lewy body, he's the one that would undergo the skin biopsy. Okay, thanks. So um, next question, and this I, I sort of see as falling under the first do no harm. Yeah. Um, so it says, is it important to have an official diagnosis for a patient that's older than 90? Um, and in that, what does the, that diagnosis gain the patient if they aren't interested in further treatment? So I would say um, trying to identify the type of dementia from a clinical side, you know, obviously from a research side, looking towards the day where we have cures of dementia, it's gonna be most important. But from a clinical side, I think the most benefit that it gives a family um, and the patient is what to expect for a prognosis. So like if I think um, somebody has frontal lobe dementia, very similar to this gentleman, um, the minister case, um, it's not unexpected that those patients may only live another five to seven years. Somebody has Alzheimer's disease, it would not be unexpected if we got them early in the diagnosis, they may live another 10 to 15. So sometimes I think it helps more from a planning side of what's going to happen, what kind of symptoms to look for and how long that they'll be. Um, if somebody has, you know, we have a 90 year old woman who's presenting with memory symptoms, she has cognitive impairment, she has functional decline, um, she has dementia. Whether she's a vascular dementia, an Alzheimer's, a mixed dementia, her prognosis is going to be pretty similar. Um, so that case, that patient probably would be better served by trying. If the family's interested in medicines, sure, give her a trial of a cholinesterase inhibitor or mimantine. But I would probably also look at other medical causes and just make sure there's not anything else that needs treated. Okay. Um, the next one is... You mentioned in the beginning that when considering declines in ADLs um, to exclude medical reasons, you mentioned electrolyte imbalance or renal failure, but could you mention the third one? Um, so everybody needs to have kind of our standard, you know, complete metabolic panel, um, little check kidney, liver, and electrolytes. They need to have a recent complete blood count. Um, and then kind of the three that we may not always think about is routine labs, um, a vitamin B12, a thyroid, and a folate. Those are pretty much standard for everybody. And then our other kind of lab workup really depends on what we think may be happening. Um, so again, if we think about that 90-year-old woman um, from the last question, that patient, we're probably not going to be expecting something like HIV. We're probably not going to be expecting something... Um, like a heavy metal exposure from work. Um, so she wouldn't necessarily need to have some of those other less common labs done. Okay, so um, the next question, I think you answered um, in your last answer, um, not, not the one you just did, the one previous, the first half of this question, um, but the second half is still relevant. So what is the prognosis of the different dementias? And do you talk about it with patients and how? Um, so hopefully most of the patients who are having a dementia evaluation have a caregiver, whether that's a spouse, an adult child, a grandchild, um, because often our patients who have a diagnosis of dementia, 
um, are not going to remember. Um, so we really need to have a caregiver or someone who can, I think, follow through on a plan. Um, I do think it is important to be honest with a family and as much as you can with the patient. We do have some family members um, that may tell me prior to their evaluation, you know, we suspect mom has Alzheimer's, her mom died from this. Even if you think it's Alzheimer's, can you not say that to her? Like, could you just call it dementia? She'll take that better. Um, and I think that's fine. Um, and sometimes it's even if we have some, someone who's very anxious about having a memory disorder, after we do our assessment, I may tell the family, um, you know, her diagnosis is pointing to a vascular dementia or an Alzheimer's dementia, but it may be something that when we have a discussion at follow-up visits or even that initial assessment to the patient, it may be, you know, your memory testing shows that you have a primary memory disorder that's called a neurodegenerative disease, meaning that it's expected to progress over time. Here are some tests we can do to try to identify what type of memory disorder you have. And then we need to talk about any medicines if we're interested in trying those to slow progression down. Um, most of our dementias that we see, you know, if we look at Alzheimer's disease, um, again, most common, we still expect patients to have that um, diagnosis to progress. If we catch them in a mild cognitive impairment or an early stage, we probably will have them followed maybe even up to 10 years, in some cases longer. Vascular dementia, if someone controls their risk factors early in the diagnosis, um, you know, if they stop smoking, if they start taking their insulin, if they start going to the doctor and taking care of that vascular disease, they can have a very slow, kind of pretty boring progression. We've had a lot of patients um, who may meet criteria for a vascular uh, mild cognitive impairment or an early stage vascular dementia. And if their vascular disease risk factors are controlled, they may stay in that early stage for many years, and we don't really see a lot of progression for them. Um, frontal temporal dementia is much faster, um, probably five to seven years is expected. Um, that is something probably not the best idea to try to give that conversation at the first visit. Um, we see our patients for memory loss at least every six months, and it may be something that gradually gets introduced for patients. Lewy body disease can be variable, um, and part of that will be based on age, but um, probably still closer to that seven to 10 age range or seven to 10 year range. Thanks. So um, it, it looks like I see um, a question or two that have gone over into the chat. It's just easier for us if you can put it in the Q&A section. Um, the next question that I see, um, do you see an increase in dementia in patients who have attention deficit disorder? Um, not necessarily. I will say that there are, we have had a fair number of patients who have been diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. Um, they may undergo neuropsychology testing um, and I, I will kind of say neuropsychology testing kind of comes with a caveat. There's two kind of two pathways. Um, the neuropsychologists who are trained within neuropsychology means that they have specialized training and then require a board certification um, in neuropsychology. So meaning in memory disorders, that's going to be much higher than someone, you know, a much higher caliber than somebody who's a psychologist who has an interest in memory and who bases a diagnosis on more of a psychological analysis or a psychological interview. But we have had some patients who've undergone neuropsychology evaluation, again, with a primary psychologist and been diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 70. That's not very common. Um, and for most patients, pretty unlikely. But if you do a full assessment, you do see that they have impairments in attention and often um, complex attention and executive dysfunction. Those patients probably have more of a dementia or even a mild cognitive impairment kind of pre-dementia syndrome. It's just that they were misdiagnosed as an ADHD. We see that quite often. Um, but patients who, you know, if you have ADHD diagnosed when you're 24 or 16, um, not there's nothing research wise or evidence based that shows that that increases risk of dementia. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. Lastly, I see 
what is the prognosis of mixed diagnosis of vascular and Alzheimer's? Um, so that one clinically will look like what most of us associate our Alzheimer's disease with. So a slow progression. Um, typically, um, they're followed annually or every six months. Um, ideally, you know, if they don't have a vascular event like a stroke, a heart attack, um, starting dialysis even, they don't have vascular events, they can have a very slow gradual progression too. Um, we have patients, you know, again, um, if we don't control vascular risk factors, so say someone continues to smoke, um, they continue to decide that we're not going to take our insulin even though we're diabetic. We do also have a fair number of patients like that. Um, and we, um, I have one patient I particularly remember, I think she's 62 now, and she's had six major strokes. Um, so obviously for her, the two to two and a half to three year range period when those strokes occurred, she had a very rapid progression of symptoms. Um, but after the last stroke, um, I think her family had kind of been fed up with, with her lack of compliance. So they just kind of took over managing her diabetes and she no longer drives and took a lot of things out of the house. Now that her A1C has been controlled, she hasn't had a stroke in a couple of years. So the last couple of years, there hasn't been much change for that. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions from our participants. Um, and I had, um, during your presentation, I had come up with a couple and I'll at least just ask you once, I think it's important to this audience, how can primary care providers best support um, the patients and the families throughout the progression of this? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we know that we are putting them in good hands when we get them to our memory center mm -hmm. um, and they're getting their medical needs met. But what resources are available for us as primary care providers to meet the needs of the unintended victims of this, and that's the family and the support system around the patient. Um, I think kind of one thing from a primary care standpoint, a lot of the a lot of the things on follow-ups um, that are worrisome for families or causing more difficulties ends up being social situations. Um, so when it's time to stop driving becomes a very um, traumatic event for most patients and a lot of arguing and fighting can ensue in family. Um, so when there are big decisions that need to be made, things like driving evaluations, when it's no longer safe to live at home, those are things that, you know, if a family member brings up, I have concerns about this. Um, I really don't think mom should drive. Um, if a primary care physician could also take that same stance with the patient of, you know, with a memory disorder, I really think it's time to stop driving. That could be very helpful for the family so that everybody's all on the same page. Um, in um, Within our Louisville community too, kind of knowing where we have driving evaluations that are available, that's a great option for having an actual referral to do an objective test for driving and taking that burden of no driving or driving cessation from the primary care and also from family. So identifying where driving evaluations can be done. Um, like in Louisville, we have one through Norton, we have one at Fraser, and then there's a community group called Drive Abilities. And that's often something that you can find out online. Um, other things that are gonna be, I think very traumatic for patients um, and families is identifying when they can no longer live alone. A lot of communities um, have programs where they're called, um, I think facility, facility-based guides, like in Louisville, we have one, senior home transitions, a place for mom, identifying those agencies that actually work hand in hand with a family member to identify the appropriate place, whether that's assisted living, personal care, memory care, and then having somebody that can actually walk with the patient and family to get that transition to happen. So I think knowing those types of agencies are, are very important. And then also always, you're always able to refer a patient and family to the Alzheimer's Association. Their website's alz.org. When you log on to their website, you can actually look for your local chapter, either by your city or your zip code. The nice thing about the Alzheimer's Association, one, everything on their website's backed by research. So it's a lot of common questions that 
families may have about progressive symptoms, stages, um, what, what does research look like? Should I be taking this supplement that I read online? Um, is there any, any data to show that that helps? The Alzheimer's Association has great resources that way, but their local group, um, they'll have a phone number and that's gonna be how a family member may be able to identify things like a support group and where they meet. Um, they'll also have the opportunity if they want to be on a newsletter. The Alzheimer's Association always sends out, I believe it's about once a month, they'll send out any events that are happening. They commonly get speakers, um, special to, specialists, either from a medical side, they'll have elder law attorneys that'll come in and um, speak with families. It's a great way for them to identify things that they need to be thinking about for their Alzheimer's patients or other dementias, because Alzheimer's Association will help any family member of any patient with any type of dementia. So I think that one's very key as well. Yeah, regarding the driving evaluations and, and having those conversations with the patient and the families, they're some of the most difficult conversations I've ever had to have. But one thing that I found that was actually really effective, and, and it may be um, emotional blackmail to some degree, but I would, you know, the, the family would express their concerns and the patient would get mad. Um, because it's a loss of independence and and I get that. Mm -hmm. But I would empathize with the patient and say, I totally understand your concern about losing your independence. But let me explain this to you because I, I have taken care of you for 15 years and I know you as a person. And I think you know that your reflexes and your thought processes are not what they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever, I picked the date. Um, and let's say you're driving down the street and a kid runs out in front of your car that if you were 30 years younger, you would still hit because there's just no way to avoid it. But in the back of your mind, if that happened, you would wonder if you caused that or if it was unavoidable. And I said, I don't think that's something that you and knowing your heart and where it is that you could take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that I mean, often frame things in a, in yeah. a manner that the patients didn't see it as a threat, that they really thought that I was trying to protect them from mm -hmm. causing harm to themselves or others. Yeah. Yeah, I use tactics like that a lot. Um, I think other, you know, we, we call it sometimes compassionate deception, um, where we may, you know, like you mentioned, emotional blackmail. I think that's a, a valid argument for a lot of people, because even if they don't understand the extent of their memory impairment. A lot of them still have the same emotional commitment to, I don't wanna hurt anyone or I don't wanna cause harm. So that could be great. Um, also, I have patients that um, it's something that, you know, wow, you know, we're almost 90 and I noticed that your vision is really terrible. Can we do a vision test? Oh my goodness, how, how do you think that you're doing when you're driving? And it may end up being that we talk about the driving cessation has to stop for their vision. So many people are much more willing to approve that argument rather than a memory argument. Um, and then there, there are actually a good number of patients that, um, you know, I completely understand that, you know, you've never had a car accident. You're a safe driver. I have no questions about that but I don't have a way to get in the car with you to, to test it. But what if we had a way that you could show everybody that you are still a good driver? Would you wanna do that? Absolutely. And then they'll be on board with doing a driving test. So yeah, I think emotional deception is something that's very, very needed. Okay, I think that's all the time that we have, but I very much appreciate um, the topic and your discussion. And I think you provided some good education for the the whole group today. So thank you very much. Good. Thank you.